It's a real pleasure to have Mariana Ricci with us today. She was uh, just before this in the Intro to Music Research Seminar, and we had a really great discussion about an uh, article that she published fairly recently called Conducting Business about the way that the discourse of music and business has been conflated. And it was a really fun and great talk. And she um, comes to us today virtually from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I actually don't know where she really is right now, but that's where she's a, an associate professor of music history. Um, she has a really diverse background that we heard about more in the seminar. But I will tell you one great thing is she worked for a long time as a rock musician, about 10 years as a drummer. And her first band was called Dear Nora, who was named after her music history professor at Lewis and Clark College. So I thought that was an important thing that we needed to, to honor. Um, and that's a wonderful uh, story. And then she went to UCLA for a PhD in musicology and she pub she's published on a really wide range of topics. And I'll just give you some of her article titles. Um, what does this artwork ask of me using challenging music to teach empathy and empowerment? Comic irony in Berlioz's Herald in Italy. Amazing together, Mason Bates, classical music and neoliberal values in Echoes of the Guillotine, Berlioz and French Fantastic. And she's also written about the films of Guy Madden and the book that if you were on earlier that was mentioned, her book, Composing Capital, Classical Music in the Neoliberal Era, it was published 2019 by University of Chicago Press, is about classical music and capitalist ideologies in the contemporary United States. And she's currently working on a book about music and the political imaginary, which is what her topic is today. And so we're really great to have, it's great to have you here and let's all welcome Marianne. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. It's so fun. Um, and I really, I loved the guesting in the seminar earlier. It was really delightful to talk to all the students and <clears throat> it's just a huge honor to be asked to do this. Um, basically, so the talk I'm going to give today is this is something that I've realized I've just been rewriting over and over again um, since I gave a talk two AMSs ago. And this is like, I've lost track, but this is maybe like the 18th draft of it. And I, I, it's very strange. I've never been in this position before, but every time I try to write something new, I just end up like rewriting this paper somehow. And then I get to the end of it and I'm, I'm like, that was just that paper again. But, uh, but each time I write it with like a different focus or a different, like the argument kind of becomes different. So I can't quite, I can't quite finish it or get a handle on it. And so I'm really pleased for the opportunity to talk about it, you know, with others to like put it out there and get feedback. Okay, so it's it's about it's 41 minutes long and I tried to make a, a somewhat active PowerPoint so it won't hopefully be too boring. So I'm going to share my screen. And we'll start. Can everyone see that? Does it look good? Okay. Okay. Oh boy. Wait, why isn't it working? Why? Hang on, it wouldn't let me go. We should have practiced this, huh? So when I stop sharing screen, it lets me uh, it lets me move between the slides. Let me try this again. Okay, sweet. Okay, in 1835, Théophile Gautier published his sensational novel, Mademoiselle de Maupin, the story of a cross-dressing, swashbuckling lady knight who falls in love with both a man and a woman before riding a horse into the sunset while both of her lovers weep. Among other exploits, the publication of Maupin helped turn Gautier into one of French Romanticism's most caricatured bohemian artists. However, the book's most lasting impact had less to do with its wild plot or its author's scandalous reputation than with its preface a perhaps surprising 14,000 word manifesto about the purpose of art. Much of the manifesto takes the form of a hilarious screed against the art critics who constantly belittled Gautier and his friends. Gautier calls these critics moralists and utilitarians and parodies the way that they write about art. What purpose does this book serve? What, not a word of the needs of society, nothing civilizing and progressive, 
how instead of dealing synthetically with the great problems of humanity, can you waste time writing poetries and novels which lead to nothing and which do nothing to help the generation forward in the pathway of the future? Calling such critics goiterous cretins, Gautier insists that art is not like a railway or a plumbing system or any of the other innovations that assist humanity along the pathway of progress. He refuses to value art according to its usefulness. What's so great about usefulness anyway? In the first place, he writes, there is very little use in one being on the earth and living. From this basic existential observation, he pushes the logic of utilitarianism to its most absurd conclusion, noting that a bit of bread twice a day and a hollow cube seven or eight feet broad, long, and deep with a hole to breathe through are all we strictly require to maintain our material existence. In other words, he suggests that if all we care about are things that are materially useful to survival, we might as well live in our own coffins. After all, it would save the time and hassle of burying us when we do die. For him, rather, the fact that we spend so much of our time doing things that utilitarians consider useless is what provides life with a meaning, something that goes beyond mere physical existence. Though he was often ridiculed in the mainstream press, Gautier's manifesto played a role in spreading the romantic value of art for art's sake. This ideal can be seen in the ideas of artistic autonomy and absolute music that music theorists developed in their efforts to distinguish certain kinds of music from music made for the marketplace or for conventional social purposes like dancing. For these theorists, what is most interesting and powerful about music is found in its formal structure. And thus the more a piece of music turns inward and explores only its own internal structural logic, the better it is. This autonomous ideal became one of the foundational values of European and American musicology. And indeed, in many respects, these 19th century ideas became what art, including art music is. I always think of it as art with a capital A. I feel like art with a capital A kind of was invented by in this 19th century discourse. Not only does musical autonomy undergird our disciplinary tools and assumptions, but more importantly, the critique and rejection of autonomy has also been the basis of some of the past few decades most influential musicological interventions. In fact, today, as I will show, art for art's sake is dismissed by almost everyone, both leftists and liberals, artists, activists, and academics alike. Today, I want to try to reappraise this ideal. My exploration is philosophical and somewhat wide ranging, perhaps confusingly so, but basically the whole talk is just about the value of uselessness and about developing a different political framework for thinking about music and about ourselves. So here's a general outline. I'm gonna kind of talk about some of the different ways that contemporary ideas about art and music fixate on utility and usefulness. Then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time um, exploring what we mean when we talk about individualism and difference and how those things might could mean differently within a different political imaginary. And then I'll return to talking about uselessness and how it might paradoxically be useful. And I think that this, I hope that this will make sense. Just as Gautier's hated critics did, contemporary advocates for art and music in the US often assess value in terms of utility, whether they're arguing that the government should financially support the arts or applying for grants from philanthropic foundations or excitedly promoting the kind of entrepreneurship that can liberate art from both of these old, older funding models. For example, in a, a recent 27 page policy brief outlining talking points for explaining why the government should fund the arts, the National Assembly of State Art presents copious data demonstrating that the arts are a good public sector investment because they create jobs, produce tax revenue, and generate unique products. They help revitalize impoverished urban areas, and they teach children to be productive workers. Ultimately, incorporating the arts improves the impact of other state policies, the brief concludes, illustrating this last fact with a quote from President Eisenhower, who's... Wait, why would this start happening? So sorry. Does anyone know why that is happening? I've never had that happen before. Let me see here. Is it also happening if you use your mouse to try to advance the slides? I'll try it.
Oops. Let me see here. Maybe this will be better. Okay. So they illustrate. Right. Illustrate this last thing about how incorporating the arts improves the impact of other state policies with a quote from President Eisenhower, whose 1955 State of the Union address is sometimes cited as inaugurating the idea that the government should directly support the arts because the arts make our civilization endure and flourish and by, help, by helping promote America's various global projects. But what exactly are America's global projects? Seven months before making his speech, Eisenhower authorized the CIA to help overthrow the democratically elected government of Guatemala, an intervention that led to decades of civil war and a genocide of the Mayan people. This inaugurated a new era of American foreign policy in which such interventions are now standard procedure for both Democratic and Republican administrations. And without lingering here or belaboring the point, I just want to plant that seed and argue that sort of the like thoughtless attachment of art to helping America's global projects is something to just be a little bit critical of. But at any rate, perhaps it doesn't matter very much because such government support began dying almost as soon as it was born. While some presidents continued to tout the great role the arts play in burnishing America's global profile, since the 1970s, the condition of federal arts funding has been a precarious and hotly politicized one, as I'm sure everyone here is aware. The Pentagon continues to fund a lot of popular like art cultural production, like blockbuster movies that portray the military in a triumphalist light. It also invests heavily in video game developers who design war games that the military uses for training and recruitment. But classical music, which is what I'm interested in today, isn't particularly resonant as military recruitment propaganda. And so music institutions don't tend to get these Department of Defense funds. But there is still government support for the so-called high arts, and it primarily comes to us via the US tax code, which makes donations to nonprofit arts organizations like opera houses and art museums tax deductible, and thus incentivizes billionaire and corporate philanthropy. In, in all of these cases, the usefulness of art is clear. It's useful to the military in PR and recruitment. I mean, if we're calling Top Gun art, that may, perhaps that's somewhat loose, but that's how I mean that. And it's useful to billionaires and corporations as a tool for burnishing their public images and shielding them from paying taxes. The value of utility also manifests, albeit in somewhat different terms, in the entrepreneurial discourses that have recently been transforming classical music practice in the US. The old state and philanthropic funding models for art music are no longer viable, these entrepreneurs say, and furthermore, they're socially irrelevant and elitist anyway. To counteract this moribund condition, art music needs to enter the real world by becoming more adaptable to market conditions in order to widen audiences and increase revenues. Within this framework, music that doesn't appeal widely across multiple fan bases music like say Milton Babbitt's electronic music, which a lot of the entrepreneurial artists that I study um, subject to particular scorn is effectively useless because nobody likes it. I suggest that these quick glosses demonstrate the liberal democratic political framework upon which a lot of mainstream art discourse is built. Within liberal democracy, as Wendy Brown argues, all human and institutional activities are conducted according to a calculus of utility, benefit, or satisfaction against a microeconomic grid of scarcity, supply and demand, and moral value neutrality. The liberal imagination then correlates value, including social value, to material usefulness, and usefulness itself is specifically understood in economic terms. In these senses, I suggest many arts advocates in the US uphold, consciously or not, the, the twinned ideology of the liberal democratic, which is to say the capitalist state. Gautier was writing during the cataclysmic period in Western European history, in which ancient ideas about democracy were being put into combination with the newer liberal tradition, specifically the ideas of 18th century political economists like Adam Smith, who attached enlightenment ideals about liberty and rights to the healthy functioning of a free market. 
Gautier was acutely aware of the ways this new political imaginary was radically transforming how production worked, how society was organized, and how people and things were valued within that new society. His countrymen mocked him for valuing paintings more than railways. It's also true that he speaks from a place of privilege. Only someone who had never gone barefoot in a Parisian winter could possibly proclaim, as he did, that he would rather have a poem than a pair of shoes. Still, I see his ode to uselessness as a concerted effort to imagine differently than the dominant thinking of his time permitted. In addition to being an elitist romantic weirdo, um, which he was, he was also authentically trying to resist what he saw as the capitalist progressive projects dehumanizing effects, effects that have become ever more glaring and drastic today. Okay, if as I've suggested, contemporary mainstream art discourse is entwined with the utilitarian logic of state and capital, then what do self-identified anti-capitalists and anti-statists think about art in terms of whatever value it might hold for society? There are myriad people and communities that aren't remotely interested in any of the concerns I just charted because they operate via very different political imaginaries. For example, many strands of radical leftism or um, the traditional consensus decision-making that many indigenous communities practice uh, horizontal communities that operate via doctrines of mutual aid, etc. Music in such oppositional or revolutionary spaces serves many functions, including keeping morale up, um, building a sense of shared political goals, circulating messages, dancing. It can also be used as a weapon, for example, um, in the Stonewall riots or in the anti-gentrification protests in Los Angeles's Boyle Heights neighborhood, which often deploy mariachi bands. But I've been interested to learn that when self-identified radical anti-capitalists take part in serious debates about art and music, they often tend to value these activities in utilitarian terms similar to those of the liberals they otherwise despise. Anarchism, for example, is rigorously opposed to both capitalism and the state and is concerned not only with class struggle, but also with struggling inside our own heads to constantly root out modes of thinking, seeing, and relating to others that derive from the kinds of hierarchical power structures that make capitalism possible. This is what Emma Goldman meant when she wrote that anarchism is not a new political system, but rather it is a living force in the affairs of our life, constantly creating new conditions. As literary theorist David Weir notes, Anarchism is thus a fundamentally imaginative, experimental political ethos, and for this reason it seems uniquely well suited to aesthetic experimentation. He has this wonderful section in his book where he talks about how anarchism um, has always only been art because its political goals are so impossible to realize. It has been forced into the condition of art as this like imaginative play. It's very wonderful. So, and furthermore, its rigorous refusal of all capitalist logics would seem to align anarchism with some of Gautier's ideas about art within the capitalist progressive project. However, examining the small amount of aesthetic theory that has been generated by self-identified anarchists reveals surprisingly that with few exceptions, for example, in the work of John Zerzan, to which I will return at the end of the paper, material utility is still the primary mode for valuing art. Indeed, a recent collection of essays on anarchist aesthetics opens with a battle cry against Gautier's whole ethos. Anarchist artists, the editors write, want to refuse art for art's sake, which they characterize as pure aesthetics unmoored from a societal context. The revered anarchist illustrator Clifford Harper insists that art only has social value when it comes in the form of propaganda. Artists have to creatively explain to people exactly what anarchism is and exactly what we need to do to get there, he says, emphasizing that for him, this means representational art that communicates clear political messages. Particularly contentious in this discourse is art that is abstract, that lacks a participatory ethos, that fetishizes perfection technique and training, or that is otherwise seen as inaccessible to the masses. So you can see why anarchists are not interested in the kind of art music that um, so many of us in the music school are, are often engaged with playing and studying. There's something fierce and true about the radical rejection of art with a capital A. 
And I appreciate stances like Harper's, but I do also just wanna say that the idea that things must be obvious, didactic and simple in order to be comprehensible to the mass of the working class is also a belief held by the ruling class. And so it seems like a problematic stance for a radical to hold. Okay, so back to absolute music or what we often call the music itself. For several decades, musicologists wanting to contribute to the social good, as well as to explain the relevance of our work to the public, have argued vociferously against the autonomous ideal that music theorists from the 19th century to the modern era deployed as a means of insisting that certain kinds of music transcend the tawdry social plane. In refusing this old fashioned value, Musicologists since the 90s have insisted that music's meaning is always socially constructed, and more importantly, that it can and should be thought of as political in various ways. And maybe most importantly of all, that musicology itself is and should be a field of inquiry that is engaged in political work. However, in pushing back against what he sees as the smugness of musicology's impression of itself as political, James Curry takes up the issue of absolute music. He notes that for 30 years, we've all been simply nodding our heads together in agreement that the old notion of absolute music is obviously politically bad. Yet this self-satisfied group nodding is not actually critique, he holds. Rather, it's just an excuse to nod together, or what today we might call virtue signaling. Curry's argument is similar to the one I made above about arts advocacy. The musicology's political frame is imbricated with that of liberal capitalism, which means that our discipline's political lens is too impoverished and reactionary to do anything but violence on music when it tries to analyze it in politically engaged ways. Thus, he suggests that in order to preserve both music and musicology, we should stop thinking of our work as political and should revisit the idea that music, in addition to having social meanings, might also actually be autonomous by which he means music isn't just a code to crack in order to see all the things it's showing us about reality. It is also something that exceeds our ability to explain or fully know. I think we should pay attention to Curry's critique of disciplinary groupthink. And I think his injunction that we need to critically engage with ourselves, our assumptions, our frames, the things that we accept or reject out of hand is vitally important to heed. And furthermore, I really love his commitment to the belief that music and its ephemerality, its invisibility, and the way that it acts upon us without our being able to explain why or how it does, um, that in all of those qualities, it evades us in some way. And that in doing so, it might show us something radically different from what we think we already know. After all, he notes, if we cannot see something other than ourselves, then we die. However, I do not advocate for a retreat from politics. Rather, I suggest that we grapple with what it means to be political in the first place, and that in doing so, we lay the foundation for a new musicological politics, one that can be consciously and to some degree productively opposed to capitalism, and thus oriented toward the envisioning and creation of a new world. I think this is a contradictory and vexing thing that I'm suggesting. And the fact that my suggestion is rooted in a reappraisal of musical autonomy is more problematic still. For example, isn't there something problematic in the way the autonomous ideal seems to reject the social, the collective in favor of a radically isolated individual freedom? This seems like what Adorno is saying, for example, when he talks about autonomous art as the safeguard of individualism. Capitalist modernity militates so powerfully against the expression of any really individual thought or act that the authentic artist has no choice but to compose in a radically self-contained and increasingly illegible way, almost like the artist um, has to ward off any act of connecting or communicating with others for fear of being commodified. If this is what autonomy is, is all about, as many musicologists, both, both pro and con, have argued, then indeed it doesn't seem productively political. In addressing these difficulties, I will take up one of the central preoccupations of contemporary musicology and indeed of contemporary American culture generally, which is difference. The dynamic between individualism and society raises ceaseless questions about difference. 
to what degree should individuals be allowed to be different and how should their various differences be negotiated within a society? The answer to this question will comprise a major aspect of any political imaginary. Within contemporary liberalism, for example, difference is rhetorically celebrated, but is in reality a problem to be resolved, even eradicated, ideally through negotiation and compromise, but if necessary, through the enforcement of laws. Under liberalism, for example, gender, racial, and cultural differences are regulated by diversity management practices within which, in Angela Davis's words, the purpose of acknowledging difference is to guarantee that the enterprise functions as efficiently as it would if there were no cultural differences at all. Within mainstream liberal capitalist life, Davis notes, although you are permitted to be an other, you must work as if you were not a member of a marginalized group. So that's one way that a political imaginary conceives of difference, which is as sort of like uh, difference as sameness, where we all kind of are allowed to have certain markers of difference, but we have to regulate ourselves in public and in the workplace so that we're all actually the same. This is actually very similar to what Adorno thinks about difference in society, despite his long-standing reputation as an antisocial elitist. Indeed, in a book-length dialogue with him, Fumi Okiji demonstrates some of the ways his thought has been misunderstood as antisocial. When we read him this way, we are assuming there's only one meaning of the word society, when obviously that isn't true. When Adorno juxtaposes individual freedom against the oppressiveness of society, he's talking about this society specifically, meaning a society totally shot through by and infected with commodification and capitalist ideology. This society is bad for individuals, not society in general, not the general principle of living together. In reality, as Okiji points out, Adorno believed that individual freedom was absolutely contingent on social life and sociality. True individualism involves an awareness of the individual's dependence on what it is not. In short, for Adorno, as for Akiji, an individual cannot reach truth alone. I need other people, not only in order to physically survive, but also in order to know who I even am. This is the great, beautiful paradox of difference. It's a panoply of eyes, all knowing our, our own uniqueness, precisely by seeing the uniqueness of others. It is this kind of radical recognition of real difference that capitalism's rhetorical promotion of diversity and its commodification of identity seeks to destroy. But if in reality, individualism is derived somehow from communalism, what does that mean? In American political and ideological life, the collective and the individual are starkly opposed to one another. Here, the phrase communal individualism can appear only as an oxymoron, two opposites, indeed two enemies. We envision an individual as someone who wants to do whatever they want and who is constrained from doing so in various ways by the needs of society within which the individual's freedom must be restricted for the good of the whole. And you know, Freud wrote an entire book about the supposed dynamic where he argued that <clears throat> society is civilization is obviously necessary for humanity's survival, but it's also a prison so repressive that living inside of it forces us into mental illness and drug addiction. Um, it's a great book, actually. Uh, yeah. So within modern liberal democracy, in other words, the individual is a problem for the collective and vice versa. But many contemporary thinkers like Fumi Okiji have called for us to answer the question of difference differently. They insist that the constant negotiation of difference is the point, the source of our collective strength, rather than something to be managed or erased. The political theorist Chantal Mouffe says, this new version of democracy ought to be rooted in what she calls agonistic pluralism, for example, meaning a democratic politics within which differences are never resolved. And in fact, we don't want them to be resolved. Their constant negotiation is what society is. Along similar lines, the anthropologist Anna Singh advocates a new understanding of the collective life of everything on earth as a polyphonic assemblage made up of different journeys, concerns, interests, and survival networks, some of which intersect and some of which do not, some of which have shared goals and some of which do not. Singh asks that we learn to celebrate contradictory entanglements rather than the unified progress narratives so important to liberals. 
these sorts of radical re-envisionings of democracy present a version of collectivity that insists on remaining heterogeneous in more than a merely rhetorical way, and that in doing so refuses to make itself legible to status quo systems of power and domination that seek to make us all the same. In my own efforts to construct a different political imaginary for myself along these lines, I've drawn on a lot of musical, musicological work like Okiji's, as well as on the musicologist Rachel Mundy's suggestion that we radically reconfigure how we view difference in order to construct a version of humanistic inquiry that is able to take the experiences of other animals into account. Where Okiji demonstrates that Western humanistic understandings of freedom and individualism developed in dialogue with the growing need to manage racial difference, in other words, to justify African chattel slavery and colonialism. Mundy reveals the way the ethical framework of humanistic differencing, for example, the distinguishing of nature from culture and the human from the animal, has constituted an unsustainable divide that can't be resolved without simultaneously addressing the question of how difference has been historically constructed in the 20th century. Many authors, both within and outside of musicology, have helped transform my understandings of individualism and collectivity. As has perhaps now become clear, what all of this work has in common is a shared commitment to some notion of refusal. Fumi Okiji, for example, joins Adorno in calling for us to refuse participation in the upkeep of a fabricated world, while Mundy's work refuses some of the bedrock assumptions and dichotomies of humanistic scholarship. In their book, The Undercommons, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney call for academics to refuse the university while paradoxically staying inside of it, thus becoming subversive intellectuals. In the introduction to the book, Jack Halberstam notes that the path toward decolonization is paved with refusal. The first step for Halberstam is that we must learn how to desire a different version of freedom than the one the power structure tells us that we want. This emphasis on refusal recalls for me the art theorist Jenny O'Dell's notion of refusal in place, which brings us back to the reconfigured version of collective autonomy I'm trying to construct. O'Dell suggests that the impulse to stand apart from what we experience as oppressive in society could actually represent the moment in which the desperate desire to leave forever matures into a commitment to live in permanent refusal where one already is and to meet others in the common space of that refusal. Odell gives many powerful examples of refusal in place, one of which returns us finally to the value of uselessness. This example is Old Survivor a 500 year old redwood tree who lives in the Oakland Hills. Old Survivor is Oakland's only remaining old growth redwood, a holdover from a long gone era during which all of the ancient trees were logged following the gold rush. Old Survivor survived thanks to its difficult location on a steep slope, its twisted awkward shape and its shortness relative to the rest of the bygone redwoods in the area. In other words, Odell writes, Old Survivor survived largely by appearing useless to loggers as a timber tree. This uselessness has enabled it to live, but not in the kind of hermetic isolation Adorno describes, and not in the hollow utilitarian cube of Gautier's satire. Rather, Old, Survivor, old Survivor's individual survival has powerfully social ramifications. Birds build their nests in it, myriad insect colonies inhabit it, its massive root system performs maintenance care by inhibiting erosion and runoff. Hikers rest in the shade it provides. Thus, Old Survivor serves as a living metaphor of refusing in place and of the way that such resistance is explicitly figured as collective, a common property to which we all have access. Both the tree and the life forms that interact with it are participating together, but in what Odell calls the wrong way when looked at through the lens of capitalist productivity. This resonates with Adorno's observation that inscrutability resists commodification. But again, as with easy statements about society, I think it's important to be specific. To whom should things be inscrutable? Adorno would say to everybody, because there are no longer individuals in the true sense of the word. There is no one left to communicate with. By contrast, though, old survivor's inscrutability is profuse and wildly social. 
The birds, insects, hikers, and bacteria that engage with it do not find the tree or one another inscrutable at all. Only timber companies do. Bringing these thoughts closer to home, Moten and Harney explored a similar idea in a recent talk about untangling the concepts of work and job. Discussing academic jobs in particular, they noted that sadly, our feel for work, for practice, is slightened obsessed as we all are and must be with the mechanics, economics, and metaphysics of the job. If the university today is, in their words, a dirty business and a state apparatus, a credential granting front for finance capitalism, and a machine for stratification, then what does or could it mean to nonetheless find good work to do within the job of working here? After all, there are no good jobs out there, and you can't not do your job if you quit your job. So what could it mean within the university to do the work without doing the job? Moten and Harney are generally allergic to giving concrete examples. The point is for each of us to ask this question of ourselves based on our own context and our own capability. Not doing your job when you have achieved tenure is different from not doing your job when you are pre-tenure or an adjunct. We all have different jobs to not do. That's part of the radical power of real difference. What acts of refusal might be possible? What imaginative exercises might help us bend our brains in new directions and break out of the rigid political imaginary we've inhabited for so long? And can music help us on this journey? I have a post-it above my desk that's a quote from an early Ruth Soli essay, Ask Unfamiliar Questions. It's such a simple, even a simplistic injunction. I feel like if I saw it on a bumper sticker, I would roll my eyes. It's, it sounds really twee. And yet it suddenly strikes, st struck me as really profound. And that's why I stuck that up there. What happens when you ask an unfamiliar question, meaning an unfamiliar type of question, one that doesn't take the usual starting points as givens? Rachel Mundy gives a good example when she asks, what is an anti-speciesist history of music? For most of us, the idea that music is a human practice is so obvious as to have become invisible. That just is what music is. It's something humans do. But what if other animals do it too? What if birdsong is music rather than a type of sonic utterance totally different from music as some 19th century white European and American naturalists took great pains to insist? What would it mean for us if other animals experienced and participated in constructing an aesthetic realm? It would mean that some fundamental unexamined truths about the human condition in the Western Enlightenment tradition might be false or incomplete. After all, as Jenny O'Dell notes, it's easy to miss the fact that when you look at a bird, the bird is also looking back at you. What new knowledge might arise in probing into that encounter, the encounter between human constructed sound and the constructed sounds of birds and the mutual rather than one-sided act of listening, thinking, and knowing that this encounter entails. What might seem new about our politics, our activities, and our work if we let such questions guide us, rather than submitting to the pleasurable lassitude of continuing to nod together at the same old truisms about music and humanity. Musicologists and musicians, like everybody in the humanities, like everybody everywhere, are pressured to justify ourselves in market terms. We work to make ourselves seem useful to capital by demonstrating that our classes teach transferable market skills and prepare our students to compete on the job market. Some of us go even further in justifying ourselves to capitalists. For example, by publishing articles proving that getting an arts degree is worthwhile because tech companies want to hire creative types. Similarly, artists and musicians are pressured to attach what they do to the values and thought frameworks of the market. These moves in academia and in art practice are figured as survival mechanisms, but I would, ar I would argue that in a lot of ways they merely hasten our death. After all, if Old Survivor had been more legible to capitalists, it would have been killed 100 years ago. So for me, despite its many contradictions, there's something here in musical autonomy, something potentially radical. The anarchist anthropologist David Graeber argues that despite its many obvious bourgeois trappings, the old notion of art for art's sake simply represents the yearning for unalienated labor, labor undertaken at our own behest and for our own reasons. This yearning resonates with Moten and Harney's observations about finding the work within the job and trying to do the one without doing the other. 
I think academics and musicians are in a uniquely good position to re-examine the yearning for unalienated labor. I submit that none of us got into this field because we wanted to make money. Something else drove us to it and something else underlies our choice to be here. So maybe we are well positioned to start embracing rather than denying the uselessness of certain activities we nonetheless care deeply about. While music can and does serve all kinds of direct social purposes, many of them healthy and good, and many of them resistant or hostile to capitalism, the system's deftness at scooping up all our forms of resistance and turning them to its own profit has also been well documented. Music that serves the struggle today becomes tomorrow's Jeep commercial. Thus, as many have noted, conventional forms of resistance like protest songs often lack long-term efficacy as the forms our resistance take must be constantly changed in our efforts to evade capitalism's commodification of dissent. This might be one reason to rethink the kind of abstract art and music that so many leftists scorn. The anarchist John Zerzan, for example, puts a different spin on representational art that many, on the representational art that many of his political peers insist is the only kind of art that can serve class struggle. For Zerzan, by contrast, it is representational art, not abstract art, that is authoritarian because it tells us what it is and what it means. In short, it tells us how to think. Indeed, <clears throat> Clifford Harper's insistence that art serve as propaganda upholds this reading. In its content, such art may resist power. For example, a strophic song might urge citizens to revolt or a woodcut of informing workers of the joys of anarchism. Um, but in its form, Zerzan argues, such art reiterates the symbolic order and conventional ways of knowing and naming as opposed to abstract art. This notion perhaps makes more interesting the kind of abstract art music that today seems to pose the biggest problem for music advocates because of its inaccessibility and lack of wide consumer appeal. In embracing the particular version of uselessness I've tried to elucidate here, I suggest we try to reapproach the potential autonomy of music, but in a way that recontextualizes it within the contemporary political landscape, which after all is very different from the political landscape that um, Gautier was writing within or that Beethoven was composing within. We can work toward becoming useless, not by isolating ourselves within a reactionary commitment to individualist masterworks or simply by scorning society as mindless mass culture, but by reaching out into our vast collective potential for useless creative activity. Doing so might reaffirm something capitalism has never been able to account for, which is our desire to not just exist, but to love existing, and our belief that everyone else deserves to love existing too, regardless of their relative usefulness to this or that progressive project. Acts of collective uselessness can be grand gestures that actively threaten capital, for example, a general strike. They can also be comparatively small and temporary, perhaps no more than a thought experiment. As academics, we might reorient our pedagogies to center uselessness as a politically productive value. We might make ourselves useless by refusing to generate job justifying reports, or perhaps by mischievously generating them in such unparsable business jargon that no one can make sense of them. If we agree to take on administrative roles, we might practice a kind of radical transparency with our department, let everybody in on all the information, refuse to keep the administration secrets, show everyone the money and show everyone where the money goes. These are thought experiments for academics. What are some experiments in refusal that musicians might try out? What is the work in the job for you? Since we're all different, we all have different life paths, refusal looks different for everyone but I suggest that we start practicing our own refusal in place in which we stay consciously rooted in music, not despite the difficulty of justifying it to the capitalist state, but because of that difficulty and because of the radical new imaginative possibilities that that difficulty might open up for us. Thank you, I'm gonna stop share. Let's all thank Mariana virtually, however you wanna do it. This was really a great talk. Um, we definitely have time for questions. And I think what I want to do with the questions is have people raise their hand and the little hand function off to the side. And then I can call on people. And I will try to keep an eye on the names. 
as they come up. So um, why don't we start? Do you have a question now? Uh, Frank has a question. Thank you. This was this is wonderful and really thought provoking. Am I audible here? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I especially I appreciate um, the treatment of Adorno here, and I detect I'm sure you have too. There's a kind of ritualistic flogging that he undergoes in a lot of musicological discourse nowadays. That strikes me as quite lazy and virtue signally, for lack of better um, uh, uh, better way to put it. So I don't have much more than, than to say that, that that rang true to me. Um, but I do have a question though, which is perhaps more about praxis than theory. And I'm curious, one of the, I think most inequitable places in our, our discipline nowadays is um, graduate students entering the job market. Uh, and it, it, this uh, uh, discourse about refusal, I mean, it sounds wonderful to me, you know, uh, who has a, a tenure track position, but what does refusal sound like for someone who's ABD or on the job market for the second, third, fourth year dealing with this, you know, uh, horrifically unfair bureaucratic um, uh, a system with no guarantee of, of a, a profession or a job, much less work? Like, are, are there any concrete things that we can offer them which refuse to accept the terms but still, you know, still hold the promise of long term? prosperity, you know, for that, for that individual. Yeah, I mean, that the that Moten and Harney talk that I attended where I got some of those ideas about the work and the job was actually a talk they gave to grad students. Um, and so it was like an engage, it was a conversation with, it wasn't even, they started with a talk, but then it was mostly like an hour long conversation with grad students from, from a bunch of different fields. And it was really wonderful because that was the, the question. That was what everyone wanted to talk about. And, <clears throat> you know, Moten and Harney were both acknowledging like they're old fancy men. They are, they have, you know, a lot of money. They have a lot of power such as it is, you know, like within the academic framework. And so they didn't, they, they didn't want to give anybody rules to follow because of this very fact that, you know, Fred Moten can say, oh, I'm not give, giving any grades. So sue me. And, but, you know, an adjunct um, instructor or a TA or something might not have that ability to do that kind of refusal. So that's the point of like it looking different for everyone. And it's more about like, I think, like I said, sometimes the act of refusal can be in your own head. We talked earlier in the seminar about not buying into certain things. So like we all have to do stuff to survive, but maybe, maybe the one thing we can do is not is not like agree to colonize ourselves by agreeing with the terms that are set. We can say to ourselves, I don't agree with these terms. I don't agree, I don't accept the terms or whatever. And we might hold out little moments like, I don't know, maybe, maybe, and I don't wanna give examples either because it's, it's, it's a private choice. But I think about things like, uh, yeah, I'll submit my syllabus for review to this administrative committee that wants to make sure all my learning outcomes add up and blah, blah, blah. But then the syllabus I give to the class is going to be whatever I want, right? So any, and anyone can do that. Like no one, there's, that's one of the great, the great uh, beauties of our work, even at the even at um, maybe not the TA level, but like even at the adjunct levels that no one really checks up on you. <laughs> so maybe taking that as like a power place to, to work and act from and inhabiting these two realms. I really like the paradox of like having the job and the work and doing like maintaining them both. I really like that. I came to that Moten and Harney talk at a really dark place in my life where I was like, maybe I should quit my job. And they were like, what's the point of quitting your job? What job are you gonna get where you're like doing only amazing, productive, socially good work? They don't exist out there. And we don't need people to quit their jobs. We need people to practice these little moments of refusal in whatever way, big or small that that looks. And so I don't know, I think it's a seed. I think it's a, I think it's a practice that anyone can bring into their lives, no matter how precarious you are, even if it's just that act of refusing to emotionally buy into the terms that are being placed on you and then see what grows from there. Great, thanks. Uh, John McDonald. Well, I just want to say I'm super charged by your work. 
Thank you so much. I feel like you've been talking about what I've been doing for the last 30 years at Tufts. Um, uh, I'm reminded that my sophomore music theory teacher said to me, it really grosses me out to put a grade on a piece of music. So I've never done it. Um, and you know, my little act of refusal was just to stick a grade in there and tell everyone that um, I'll change it to whatever you want in the six week grace period um, after the semester is over and I've done it for 30 years. Um, anyway, I have a question. It's, I, I think it's a short one and I wanna make sure that other people have a chance to ask questions. Um, you, you talked about absolute music. Could you expound a little bit on uh, what makes absolute music absolute? Do you mean what I think or you want like a little- Yeah, I, th I think what you think. I'm interested in what you think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that music that is, is um, music that is sort of like working out its own problem and that isn't about, isn't about anything consciously that isn't telling you what it's about, that isn't referring outside of itself, but it's trying to, I mean, there's that Hans Lickian notion of, of like pure musical form. I guess that's what I'm talking about. And it, but it doesn't have to be a Beethoven symphony like he thought it did. Uh, um, I guess I, I'm, I'm interested in that, the definition of absolute music as music that is non-referential, that is abstract, that is somehow purely musical or trying to be purely musical. Um, that's that's I, the definition I use. But I think in, you don't say anything about communication in that definition. So I think you can be, uh, be writing absolute music and still be trying to communicate. Yeah. And I mean, it's a com communicative art. So no, no matter what you do, you have to communicate. I mean, that's, I, I think that's part of what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, otherwise don't do it. <laughs> do something else. Or that it can be, um, I think like in the discourses that I write about, lots of times communication is figured in this really weird way where it's this very direct, like, I have a thing that I say to you and then you take it from me and then you know it. Um, and whereas like, I think that this thing I'm trying to think through and talk about is more <laughs> like um, communication as like a space created in which we like all can enter on somewhat more equal terms and like experimentally try to know differently rather than this like top down thing of, you know, I tell you what I think and you just have to take it. And I think that that's sort of what I like about John Zerzan's uh, articles about representational art and abstraction is like that that the in kind of refusing any conventional way of being read a piece of art can create a space where we all have to sort of solve it together. Um, that's sort of what I'm talking about, I think. Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a, a composer a lot of us know, um, TJ Anderson, who is an emeritus faculty member uh, with us. And he, he sums it up really simply. He says, our uh, composer's job is to document the culture, mm. period. Then he's, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I think it sort of subsumes a lot of what you were saying as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nate. Hello again. Hi. Uh, loved your talk. It was similarly to John, it was really invigorating. Um, I love all the different polls and the stuff about animals. It's it <laughs> great. That book is um, great. So um, my, I, I understand this sort of the, the role of unlearning by the individual in these, you know, not the, these acts of resistance. But I'm curious about, you know, your goals, professional projects, or just things that you could see for forming coalition, um, for exploring and defining these ideas, and essentially for building a new story um, for what music is, means, and can be. Um, just curious. Building that. coalition, yeah. That's the million dollar question, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I think about that a lot, and you know, um, especially in the context of a music department when there's so many different um, concerns and, and even just very, very different, very fundamental ideas about what music even is or what we're all doing here together. Um, 
it can be really hard. Uh, I think that I guess I've mostly, um, I think a lot about the classroom as a place of building coalition, which I know you talked about that in the seminar as a teacher, like making the classroom a space where these like little acts of freedom can happen. Um, and I think that that's not something to overlook. I think the classroom can be a powerful place where coalition gets built. And then uh, in terms of refusal, I don't know. I mean, like I would not say, I wouldn't hold myself up as someone who has like solved this problem. Uh, I still sit in commi committee meetings where the terms are set by, you know, in a top down way in a way that I don't really agree with. And I kind of like say my piece and then nobody else agrees with me and then we have to move on. And that's like, you know, how it goes. So, um, but I think that it's in the kind of relentlessness of your personal relationships that you build that coalition. You like are constantly planting seeds and constantly pushing back while also, um, um, I'm really invested in acknowledging like the the um, the place that everyone is coming from, right? Like everyone's trying to survive. Everyone is battling at different levels of ideological conditioning, uh, and so I think coalition. I think authentic coalition building is about like knowing knowing which seeds to plant when, right? Like you don't just walk into the first faculty meeting of the year and be like. <laughs> I think everyone needs to do everything differently in their classes, like you know everything because you don't. And I think in politics, that's what coalition, that's what people often think coalition building should look like, but I don't agree, right? I think it's like small personal acts, acts of um, mutual sort of like seeing and working together. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's your truth about the question, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Another, anybody else at this point? Let's see. Oh, Annie. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. I thought it was really fascinating. It has given me a lot to think about. Um, so I have kind of like a, a two-part question. Um, so the first part is when you're, when you were talking about usefulness versus and like uselessness, um, it, it seemed to me like a lot of that was grounded in like economic utility as that definition. I'm wondering how and if this like ideas of relevance and accessibility factor into that definition of useful or uselessness that you put up. And also why or whether or not your use of the word uselessness is deliberate, um, given that it, like the connotations around that word are pretty, I think, negative. Like if you say something is useless, that's like not a great thing. And I'm wondering if your decision to use this word is kind of like a refusal itself to give weight to this idea of utility. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. I, I, I use that word because it's kind of an aggressive sounding word. Yeah, like we know that being useless is the worst thing that anything could ever be. Um, but I think uselessness and usefulness themselves are a great examples of words that are very seldom interrogated very closely. I think that we kind of just like are a, a lot of the times we just sort of accept what what um, how those terms are defined. And so I think I am using, using that term intentionally um, to sort of like spark a kind of re, uh, like reevaluation of it. I also am taking that term from Gautier because his whole manifesto is about uselessness and usefulness. He uses those words really aggressively. He, the famous quote from that manifesto, which I didn't use in the, in the talk is um, he says, he says uh, nothing that is Nothing that is beautiful is indispensable to life and everything that is useful is ugly. <laughs> so he's making a really like on the other, other side, he's saying anything useful is ugly. It, it can't be art, it can't be beautiful because by definition, the things that are beautiful are useless. So I kind of love that the aggressiveness of those words. Um, and your first question, utility as using, formulating those words or like in, um, exploring them primarily in the sense of them being of them being figured as rooted in economics. Things are either financially useful or financially useless. That I'm taking from 
the political theory about neoliberalism that has been kind of constructed over the past couple of decades, where people like Wendy Brown, who I referenced, or, or David Harvey, uh, have taken a lot of time in, to point out the ways that the words useful and useless are deployed in mainstream discourse in a purely economic sense. And so, yeah, I think I also want people to think about what that means, that something can be uh, useful in the sense that it makes money, but does that mean it's good? I think those are really unexamined. Um, one thing I would do if I continue working on this is, of course, Marx talks a lot about use use value and usefulness. And I think I would like to bring um, a consideration of his, he's interested in those words too, right? The way that like capital becoming a commodity in some sense, or like capital is money that's stripped of its use value. All of that stuff is really interesting to me too. So great question. Yes, I love those words. I use them intentionally. And, um, and I'm talking primarily, you're correct about thinking of things as useful in the sense that they are somehow economically beneficial. That's something I want to push back on. Thanks. Uh, Jake? Hi, um, I just wanted to say it's a wonderful talk and it's actually a conversation I was just having with friends literally last night about this exact topic. Um, and I was wondering, one thing that was brought up, I think, and one thing that Annie brought up in her question, um, I was hoping you could talk about more is the idea of accessibility and usefulness, right? When we look at creating music that is accessible to everyday people, um, and is there what, how value works with that, how that deals with this idea of uselessness and usefulness? Yeah, I think accessibility is a huge, yes, thank you for reminding me that that was part of Annie's question. Accessibility is a really interesting issue because as you're, you're probably aware in the particularly, although not exclusively in the like new kind of American uh, classical music discourses that I've written about like in my book and elsewhere um, where people talk about how to save classical music and how to revitalize it and how to make sure that it, it, it stays like a relevant and um, thriving art form in, in, in the contemporary world. Accessibility is a constant problem and issue, um, specifically aesthetic accessibility, right? That's what they're always talking about, how to make music that's accessible. And I think that uh, I think that the way that accessibility is formulated in a lot of this discourse is itself totally shot through with economic considerations. Accessibility just means um, the, uh, how to make stuff that the most possible number of people will enjoy. And I think that that is uh, a problematic way to figure the question of accessibility, right? I kind of mentioned it in the talk and didn't linger on it that, um, that I don't think, I think that the um, easy assumption that things have to be nice and easy and obvious for like most people to appreciate them is itself elitist and needs to be sort of like poked at, right? Like um, as though poor people can't deal with complexity, right? Like as though being poor isn't the most difficult, complex thing you can imagine, you know, experiencing in the world. Um, so I think that I think that uh, those discourses around writing music in accessible forms take a lot for granted. They kind of like make a lot of assumptions about what most people uh, enjoy, and I think that it's problematic. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, at the same time, they're, they're always uh, promoting those versions of, of accessibility. They're always putting them up against people like Milton Babbitt, who were like, I don't care if anybody listens to my music, I'm not writing it for them. Um, and that's the sort of central tension that I think I'm most interested in between uh, the sort, what I see of, as the sort of like oppressive and um, homogenizing uh, uh, impact of, of the necessity to be pleasing to everyone and to not be difficult to anyone, right? Juxtaposed against what's obviously very antisocial in totally refusing to be accessible to anybody at all. Um, yeah, that's, that's the tension. But yeah, I, just, I guess I just wanted to plant those seeds about like the way that accessibility often gets talked about is really problematic to me. 
Um, I've got a quick question. Well, I've got a really obvious question, but I'll say it anyway, which is um, like just in your presentation, I kept you know thinking about like John Cage, who is like literally an anarchist, literally um, you know trying to make useless things in a useless way, and but then like you know the like four minutes and thirty three seconds, which is this piece that's had this enormous kind of cultural, I think, ramification and resonance and. There's this app. Do you know about the app where you can anybody around the world can take a make upload a recording of four minutes and thirty three seconds to this app where you can see like you know thousands and thousands of recordings of people just from wherever they are in their life. And so, kind of the idea. Of, I think you were talking about this. It's like it's sort of becoming fluent with life is something that he was talking about. So I just wonder if like. I mean, then obviously John Cage has all sorts of problematic elements that he's kind of an authoritarian and trying to control everything and all this. But it seems like the resonance of four minutes and 33 seconds goes way beyond anything that he intended or tried to control. And so, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe yeah. that's one way to think about um, really weird experimental abstract stuff is that it it is better than anything at exceeding even what it's even what its creator intended and there's something sort of exciting about that that you can kind of i mean four minutes and 33 seconds is so weird and you can make it whatever you want it to be right whereas like maybe the more like the more representational and the more obvious and the more didactic something is the less that you can make what you want out of it um I hadn't really thought about it in that way, but it, yeah, I, I like the idea of Cage. And I think he would like it too, even though he was such a control freak in his way. Um, I, I like the idea of setting these experiments out into the world and they kind of like can take on a life of their own because I think because they so obviously present a problem that needs to be solved or grappled with. They aren't just something that you see and say, oh, that's nice. It's something that you see and you have to be like, what is this? I have to make sense of it in some way. And everyone's gonna solve that problem in their own way. Yeah, and it's it's an incredibly accessible piece in the way that really anybody can understand. Nothing could be more accessible than 433. Um, I think this has been a great talk and I'm really uh, happy to have you here. I think every it's been incredibly stimulating and a wonderful way to almost end the semester with this kind of mind-blowing, uh, wonderful, exciting talk. And I, we'll definitely have you back when we can have you in person. I would love that. Thank you for having me. It was really fun to, to talk with you all and to try and put this into words. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>